Okay, hi and welcome to um, the first lecture on convex analysis. Okay, um, so it seems like um, at least uh, three people have been present in the chat. And again, Ubuntu has some problem, let's see. Hopefully we don't have a problem here. Um, okay, so let's start. So there are, um, yeah, first, um, Let's talk about the uh, organization of this lecture uh, this year. So um, this is a, a lecture on convex analysis, which is um, supposed to be a lecture on, in the, uh, located in the masters in mathematics. Um, however, um, it's not um, it's not really that very much of advanced mathematics has to be used. So the prerequisites are basically um, yeah basic analysis one and two should be enough, I guess. Um, and of course linear algebra, so you need to know uh, what vector spaces and the RD of course um, and a little bit of topological notions, um, but that's basically it, nothing more than that. Um, everything else will be built up here from scratch. Um, so the lecture is in English. So, um, so lecture in English, exercise uh, sheets will be in English, uh, the lecture notes will be in English. Um, so you're also encouraged to participate in English, but it's not really mandatory. So if you have questions um, and want to ask them in chat or in office hours or whenever, um, and you have uh, yeah, do not know the right words to express yourself in English, <coughs> it's just no problem uh, to ask in German. So why not? And in case um, you, yeah, if you have the feeling that you did not understand something I, I tried to explain here um, because of the language, just drop a note um, and, and ask to explain that in German once again. So I'll happily do that. That's just no problem. Okay. <clears throat> so, but on the other hand, um, um, mathematical English is not that uh, complicated, um, and uh, scientific English is uh, more basic um, than kind of literature English. And um, hopefully, you will not have any problems following the lecture. Um, so we're going to use the chat um, during um, during the lecture um, for you to uh, um, ask questions or have, um, drop remarks, um, or if you spot errors, happens frequently when, when I'm going to write here something. <clears throat> and if there's an error, it would be really really helpful if you would post it in uh, in chat, <clears throat> um, because the videos will stay up. Uh, and um, if there's a note in chat, then it's much easier for future listeners um, to spot the error and then it got confused. So it's kind of community service if you um, submit errors. Okay, so there will be two lectures a week. One uh, is uh, yeah, right now, Tuesdays at 9.45. Uh, and the other is um, on Wednesdays at 11.30, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I don't do this uh, alone. So the um, assistant in this lecture will be Max Winkler. He's doing the um, exercise classes on uh, Wednesday at 8. And they will be held uh, with big blue button uh, within Stud IP. So in case you're now listening, um, this is a later point in time via YouTube. So unfortunately, the exercise classes are not on YouTube. They are only uh, in our own um, um, learning management system. So apart from that, um, so this would be a four plus two lecture, four hours of, um, of lecture and two hours of exercise classes. Um, but um, there's also the possibility um, to have it as a two plus one lecture. Um, yeah, because in some, in, uh, in, in some fields of study, it would be just helpful to have a smaller lecture for, to use for, your, for the education. And so a five credit point lecture, and this would be just the first half of uh, the term. So the first seven weeks, <coughs> meaning the first 14 lectures, Will consist of kind of a small convex analysis. So that's possible in case you only need five credit points for to fill up some um, um, some area in your studies. That's possible. Um, and the rules are basically everything is cut in half. Um, it's only the first half of the semester. It's only the, the first half of the um, uh, of the exercise sheets, and it's only kind of a shorter exam in the end about the stuff we had covered in the first half. Okay, um, and I think just just today um, the lecture. So this is official module went went online, but uh, you should not. Yeah, that's just it. Okay, um, so organization of the exercise classes um, is um, basically as usual. There will be one exercise sheet a week. So the first one is already online, and the first exercise class will also be um, tomorrow morning. And um, I think the rest of uh, concerning the lectures will be explained by Max there. 
Uh, one further thing I forgot is um, you can also use the chat to give me a note in case something is not right with the technique. So if the sound is bad or if I'm if I went off screen here with the with my paper, which happens frequently, um, please write something in the chat so that I get a get a note, especially if the sound is bad or camera gets out of focus or whatever. Okay, um, this was that. Uh, yeah, then the Studienleistung. Um, so there's the Studienleistung and the Prüfungsleistung in this lecture, so for, for successful completion. Um, Studienleistung is uh, just 50% of the points on the um, exercise sheets. And um, of course, we uh, also ex expect um, active participation in the exercise classes. Um, on top of that, there's uh, bonus points, sometimes uh, maybe through the exercise sheets, but always uh, through the lecture notes. You may have seen that I've uploaded lecture notes already in IP For the day, it's just three pages, but anyway. Um, but these are kind of hot of the press, so I just finished writing them a few days ago and only had a limited time to, um, to edit. So I guess that there's few errors per page. Um, and um, I will happily award, award uh, one bonus point for everybody who's um, finding a mathematical error and submitting it to the forum in Stud IP. Um, this will help improve the lecture notes and also community service for the others. So if you find something in the lecture notes odd, there's two possibilities. Either it's uh, it's just plain wrong and I make it, made a mistake and then everybody else is going to reading this lecture notes will find that odd and will wonder what, what's, what's wrong here. Um, and um, if you then can look up in the, in the forum and find, oh no, somebody submitted this already, it's just an error, um, then you need to wonder no more. The other possibility is that you do not really understand what's happening there and it's in fact correct. Also, quite natural, it happens frequently when I want to read a book that I <laughs> adopt every second line. Um, and then just try to submit an error. If you think it's an error, if it's wrong, and try to submit it. Sometimes this just clears it up because you think about it, think it through a second time. And sometimes it still persists and then I will happily answer in, in the forum why it's actually correct as written. Um, so this is um, bonus points for um, uh, mathematical errors. Of course, if you find any other errors, <coughs> spelling mistakes or wrong grammar or broken sentences and stuff due, uh, due to editing, please also submit that as well. Um, it's also helpful to improve the lecture notes. Um, let me see. Um, there's, yeah, I, I forgot, I just wanted to um, blend. So this one here, um, this is a little bit extended version of what I uploaded also to StudIP. You just went through the first two paragraphs, more or less. Um, the next thing are the first three. So there's an, an the Prüfungsleistung. There will be oral exams um, and more details will be posted later. You know, it's, it's not really foreseeable under what um, circumstances we can have oral exams in summer. Let's see what's going to happen. Um, we'll find a way one way or another. Okay, uh, another thing I forgot about the chat was, so um, I've seen that most of you or uh, many of you already joined, um, because this chat is already also visible here in the, um, in the live stream and will stay up on YouTube. You, if, you, if you prefer, you may change your name to a nickname for if, you, if you like. You could also, of course, um, write in chat with your normal name as most of you now did, but if you would prefer seeing uh, yeah, a nickname for you there, why not? Yeah, just do that, it's, it's, uh, it's totally fine with me. Um, okay, so I don't, I'm not really, so it's not really important for me who is writing the question, but uh, what, what the question is more, that's more, that's more important. Okay, so then, um, literature, there, I, there's a, so, a short uh, literature list. Um, so convex analysis is not that an old field, it's about, I don't know, in, this, in its current form, it's maybe about 70 years old, um, founding fathers are... Yeah, in the modern form, probably Fenchel, Werner Fenchel, and also um, Ralph Tyrell Rockefeller. Um, and Ralph Tyrell Rockefeller wrote a, kind of the most influential book on convex analysis back in the 70s. Um, and I think it's building a lot on the lecture notes by Fenchel from the 50s. And that's still the classical reference for convex analysis um, in the dimensional real space. Um, it's very well written, even though it's 70 years, uh, it's 50 years old already. Um, and it's well organized, um, it's a very nice thing. 
Um, yeah. So I probably am not going to use it as a base material for, for the lecture because it's kind of it's, it's kind of more verbally and for lecture notes I would like it a little more uh, uh, um, <coughs> a little bit, yeah, in a little bit shorter comprehensive form. Okay, but there are more modern books. Um, there's, for example, this book by Borwein and Van der Werf, Convex Functions, which, um, yeah, as the title says, focuses more on functions and not so much on, on, on sets and cones and stuff, but uh, anyway. Um, then there is another book by Borwein right now with Adrian Lewis. It's Convex Analysis and Nonlinear Optimization, which gives a little bit more focus on optimization in the second part of the, um, uh, or in, the in the later part of the book. Um, and then there's this Tomy um, Convex Analysis and Monitoring Operator Theory in Hilbert Spaces um, by Bauschke and Combet, second edition from 2017. It's kind of, I don't know, 500 something pages big. Um, it's an uh, extensive reference, so it's not really used, um, cannot be used to yeah, just read it from, from cover to cover or from, from, from front to end. Um, but if you want to look um, something up, then that's the way to go. Everything about convex analysis in there, I guess. Um, yeah, so convex analysis is really um, close to uh, convex optimization. That's probably one of the main fields of application of convex analysis. And so books with the title um, convex optimization are also um, useful for this lecture here. And there's one, probably the most popular one is the one by Stephen Boyd and Lieben Vandenberger, convex optimization. And this is also f uh, freely available. Um, even more recent, there's a book, First Order Methods and Optimization. It's not ex exclusively about convex optimization, but mostly by Amir Beck. Um, and another classic is Convex Analysis and Optimization by Betsikas. So these are all books which you can use as a reference um, um, during the lecture. Um, there was something else I'd like to, wanted to say, probably. Ah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the, the Hilbert space versus RD question. So and I, I asked the question and said, first, um, if any of you have heard the lecture introduction on optimization, because optimization is the main application of uh, convex analysis, uh, at least for me. So I would be just interested in that. So I actually did not attend any lecture like this. Um, so I would vote no, but because if I vote, then you can see the results um, and you see, yes, uh, no, not too many. Only it's, it's <laughs> two like this and two like that. Okay. That's not a problem, um, it's just good to know. Um, yeah, so we are not build our notions of uh, optimization, we will build up our own notions here, which may be then the same if you if you had the pleasure to lecture to, complex optim uh, to introduction optimization, then that's helpful. So and then the other thing is working knowledge about Hilbert spaces. Um, I think Hilbert spaces may come up very briefly in analysis three or something. Of course, they will be studied a lot in functional analysis, um, but they also appear in other lectures, and so maybe you've heard uh, if you come across Hilbert spaces in some other lectures. So I do, uh, so I vote yes, and let's see. Okay, and there's also two, two. Okay, fine. That's no problem. Um, I decided to um, start the lecture um, in RD, the standard Euclidean space RD, D uh, real coordinates. And with the standard Euclidean norm of a vector and the standard stand, uh, inner product in, in, the, in RD. But most of what we do could be done in an abstract separable Hilbert space anyway. It would just basically change very little things. Um, for example, the basic notions of convexity um, are all just independent and actually you don't even need Hilbert space, vector space um, within a product would be enough for a lot of things, even in a product is not needed anywhere. Um, so what, what we may do is, um, so Hilbert space gives you a little, little bit of more freedom. For example, even if you work in just an RD in finite dimensions, um, you may choose different inner products. So you probably know that every positive definite matrix, um, symmetric positive definite matrix de defines an inner product uh, on RD. So a D by D matrix, SPD, um, gives an inner product. And sometimes it's beneficial to be able to work with different inner products uh, than just a standard one. So kind of deforming the space a little to make it, to adapt it a little bit more to your problem at hand. Um, and so what we're, in the way we're doing it right now, um, we only have the standard inner product, but everything um, could be done in a different one. It would be possible and probably we'll come to that point um, at a later uh, point in the lecture. And so maybe we go through the lectures at one point and just uh, check <coughs> if what we're doing here would work in an abstract Hilbert space. So and for those of you who don't have uh, too much knowledge about Hilbert space, Hilbert space means it's a uh, vector space. And actually, I forgot to say you only need real Hilbert spaces, so a, a real vector space. 
um, which is equipped with an inner product. That's basically it. And then it's going to need to be complete. So um, Cauchy sequences need to have limits. And if it's not complete, you can consider the completion. So just adding all the limit points of Cauchy sequences and then this thing will still be a vector space and after that it will be complete. And the one more thing what, which is helpful is if the Hilbert space is separable. And this can be expressed in different ways. And one way is it has an orthonormal basis. So there's a, there is one set of vectors which are mutually orthonormal um, and every vector in the space can be, can be expressed um, as a linear combination or as a series or you know, about um, coefficients times these vectors um, and this series has to converge to the every to the vector which is given. That's one way to pose uh, what is a separable Hilbert spaces. <clears throat> and so for example you can take uh, you can consider the uh, the real vector space um, with infinite many infinitely many coordinates. Um, but then this does not form a Hilbert space because there, there's not some, you cannot define a norm. Every vector needs to have a finite norm. <coughs> um, and so um, you will only take this, um, yeah, the, the space of real sequences which are square summable. So the ab absolute the squares of the absolute values of the entries of the sequence need to be uh, summable, meaning need to form a convergent sequence. If you do that, you can take the standard inner product uh, of two vectors and that everything is fine, all these things converge and you get a Hilbert space, an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And the standard basis gives you a, yeah, gives you an orthonormal basis there. The other standard example is the space of um, square integrable measurable functions on some set. It's also a Hilbert space um, with an appropriate norm, but we'll probably not talk about this here. Anyways, okay. So that was anything I wanted to say before. Um, uh, so we can get rid of this again and we probably can start. But if you have any questions about the organization of the lecture or anything else, maybe I missed something I wanted to tell, um, just drop it in chat and I'm going to answer it right here. Um, so, and the chat also work, works for office hours. Um, so in any time you have any question, um, just drop it in there. Uh, probably I will also... Um, have an official office hour um, where we could meet in an um, in a meeting in, in an online meeting room. Um, but if you have any questions concerning the lectures, just post them in the chat anytime. And um, as soon as I'm as I'm on duty again, I will just answer there. Okay. So no questions popped up up to now. Um, so of course you could also use the chat for communication. Um, yeah, um, during the lectures with each other. So that's one of the upsides here for um, for these online lectures um, that you have the possibility um, to have a quiet, quiet, quiet conversation with the, with the other people uh, in, attending the lecture uh, without disturbing um, anybody else who don't want to listen. Okay, um, so then let's go. Okay, so our um, topic today is um, convex sets. So this is something. Uh, this is something which you probably already know. The notion of a convex set is so basic; it often um, it's usually treated somewhere else before. Um, usually in convex, uh, in, in the introduction course on um, analysis. Um, but if not, it's a simple notion. So what we need is um, so definition 1.1. 1 .1. Um, we are talk about sets C which live in R D. So and I. This paper here is R2, so set may look like this. That would be a set C, and we call the set convex um, if, oh, maybe one F is enough. Um, whenever we have X and Y, two points in the set C, so one X here, one point Y over there, and we have um, a scalar, lambda, which is between zero and one, one included, then it always holds that the so-called convex combination of x and y with the lambda is also in the set. And what is this convex combination? It's the vector lambda times x plus 1 minus lambda times y. This has to be also in C. Oh, not in that C, but in the set C. So that's the basic notion of convex set. Okay, so and what does that mean? Um, you probably know that, but I illustrate it anyway. So if you have two vectors x here and y there, where in 
uh, where on earth is this vector here? Lambda times x plus 1 minus lambda times y. And maybe um, it's helpful to write this also as y plus lambda times x minus y. That's the same thing, right? It's uh, 1 times uh, y plus lambda times x minus lambda times y, so this. So now I see, maybe it's now easier for you to locate where this vector is. It's kind of from y, so from here, you go lambda into the direction of this vector, and this vector x minus y, it goes minus y plus x, it's this vector here, the vector pointing from x exactly to, from y exactly to x, that's this vector here, and you go only, not the full way, but something a little less. So you scale that one, so if you, for example, take lambda equals one half, um, you would take the, go half the way and you end up here. So this is here, lambda x plus one minus lambda y. So and for lambda equals zero, you get y, for lambda equals one, you get x, and for lambda in between, you move along the connecting line from y to x. That's as simple as this. So and this guy here is called convex combination. of x and y with lambda. Okay, okay that's it. <clears throat> that's convexity. So, um, and, um, and pure, so without any formula, you could say a set is convex if for any two points in the set it holds that the line connecting these two points is also uh, contained in that set. Okay, so and one step back. So what do we need to, to, um, to define convexity? We just need a real um, vector space. So if we replace this one here by saying it has to be just a real vector space, we could define that and that would be fine. No um, need of RD is needed. Um, actually also no topology whatsoever is needed. Um, we don't need norms, inner products, nothing. It just have to be a vector space. So for example, the space of all functions would also work. Space of all real functions on a set. Um, that would work. And for then one could uh, think about so the set of all positive functions. So assuming only positive values, this would be a convex set, for example. Okay, well, anyway, um, examples of convex sets uh, yeah, will come. Uh, they will come. Okay, more general, we could also say, um, um, so it's kind of by induction, this follows. Um, if you have x1 to xn, which are all <coughs> in Rn, in Rd, um, and you have scalar lambda 1 to lambda n, all non-negative, and these need to sum to 1. Then you also say that the sum lambda i x i is also a convex combination. So then it holds if you have n points in the convex set, then any com convex combination in this sense of these um, points are also in this space, in the set. It's a kind of by induction, this follows from, from the definition. So the definition is just this, but these guys are also called convex combination if these coefficients here are all non-negative and sum to one. Okay, so that's the first thing. Then the second notion is um, the notion of the convex hull. So if you have S a subset in Rd, um, then the convex hull, convex hull, denoted by conf of s, um, is equal to the set of all convex combinations of points in s, and convex combinations in this sense here. All convex combinations of points in s. So, and for this definition here, we need this notion of convex combination. So let's do an example. Let's say that our set S um, does consist of finitely many points. Let's, uh, let's do it like this. So we have here one, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, and so on. So three, x4, x5. So what are the convex combinations of these vectors here? Um, so first, um, we have all the connecting lines. So the lines connecting these two are the convex combinations of these two vectors here. These are the convex combinations of these two vectors and these and that and these. So we have all these. But um, if you can form convex combinations of these three vectors, you can get anything which is in this triangle here. And if you can form the convex combinations of these three vectors, you can get everything which is in this triangle. And if you form convex combinations of these 
four vectors, we get everything which is here in this. So this here is the convex hull of S. That's how it looks. Okay. Um, another way to define the convex hull would be saying that it's the smallest um, convex set that contains S. So another thing is you could also think about, um, uh, let's do a second one here, if S just uh, looks like maybe like this line and this point here, um, then the convex combination would still be that thing here. And this would be the set of all convex combinations. Okay. Okay. Good. So then, um, it's actually it's not really an example. So examples are already here. Um, ah, they all already have numbers. Uh, also numbers. Example one point three is um, if you have C one and C two in R D both convex, um, then the Minkowski sum of these two sets, C one plus C two, which is nothing else than the set of all vectors x, which are of the form x one plus x two and x1 comes from c1 and x2 comes from c2 um, uh, it's convex as well and this guy here is called Minkowski sum it's also kind of a very basic notion <coughs> Minkowski sum okay <coughs> good and it's straightforward to prove so if you just what you need to take is you take two, two points in here, decompose them like this, form a convex combination and see that the convex combination kind of distributes to the to the both things which you found here and then and then you're done. That's basically it. Okay, this could also be part of a theorem or a proposition, but anyway, it's, it's so basic, I just I decided to just do it as example. Okay, so the first proposition is also so basic that I only prove one of the things and I think some of the the rest will be proven in, in the exercise. Um, so proposition one point four. Um, the following is convex. The following sets are convex. And sometimes I will abbreviate convex as by CVX. So one um, alpha times C, which is by the same kind of philosophy than we did for the Minkowski sums. It's just um, the set of vectors of the form alpha times x for all the alpha uh, x and c um, for convex c and alpha in R arbitrary. So scaling of convex sets preserves convexity. Okay. Um, you could also um, apply an arbitrary matrix, which is actually a more general case than the case one, but anyway, so if you, you can also think of A times C, which is the same thing here, it's also matrix A times X for X and C, um, for convex C, and now I write in our uh, D, and a matrix A in our M to the D. So this is a subset of, a subset of RM, um, obtained by a linear uh, operator uh, or linear matrix applied to a convex set and this preserves convexity as well. Third point is um, take and take the product of two sets, Cartesian product, which is now then a subset of Rm uh, plus D um, for convex C1 in Rm and C2 in R D. So products of sets are also so Cartesian products are also um, of convex sets are also convex. Okay. Uh, fourth point is um, the intersection of convex sets stays convex. Um, convex C I and index set. Oops. So, and it's from pictures is obvious. So if you have a point, and also by formula is obvious, if you have two points in the intersection, they lie in all of the CI. So uh, the connecting line um, also lies in all of the CI. And then that's, that's already it. Um, and then five, 
now a little bit of topology comes into play. Um, the closure, um, C bar, and interior. Uh, C circ um, are also convex for convex C. And uh, yeah, so okay. And um, I'd like to add that I this uh, write this also some maybe as CL of X, something that's um, yeah more convenient to write it like this. And this will also be written as int of C. And that is one of the typos you can expect in the in the lecture notes because then I will probably write backslash int because I forgot that the micro macro is all is, uh, is in fact interior and not int and then you will see an integral sign before in front of the convex set C and there's not what should be there there should be these letters I N T for interior okay so that's the proposition um, and it's simple to prove and to tell to to show you that it's simple um, let's prove um, the second point for convenience and then the rest can be done yeah, you can then you can do the rest by yourself for example so how this is be done um, if we have two points x and y in the set a times c then there exists uh, u and v such that x is a times u and y is uh, a times v that's how this is defined to be in the set you need something which maps into it by a um, you'll be uh, in C. I forgot that's of course important. You can find points in the set C which is mapped. Okay, and then we take a lambda um, in the interval from 0 to 1. Um, and then you have that the convex combination of u and v uh, minus lambda is also in C. And then um, you're basically done because now you can consider lambda x plus. 1 minus lambda y and see what that is. Replace this x by a u and this y by a v. And what you then can do by linearity, because it's a linear map, the lambda goes here, the 1 minus lambda also goes there, and then the i goes out, and this is a times lambda u plus 1 minus lambda v just by linearity. And this is in c, so this is in a c, and that was it. The rest. Is an exercise. And that's it for the proof here. Okay, good. <clears throat> so this is convex sets. Okay, it's very basic and it's a it's a purely algebraic notion. So it's only so the convexity only needs um, to have a vector space structure and that's it. Um, but it has some connections with the topologic topologic structure. This is the first glimpse of it. So closure and interior do not destroy convexity, um, but we will see another more surprising um, connections with the topology of the underlying space in the next. Yeah, it takes some time, but but there will be. Okay, so there's another class of important um, um, subsets of R D. Um, it's definition one point five, and this is the set S. Subset of RG is called affine. Affine set. Um, if uh, whenever you have x and oh, that's the first typo which you can catch. Um, just see to this. Um, if for two points x and y in S and any lambda now in R, it holds that lambda x plus one minus lambda y is still contained in S. That's an affine set. And the only difference to convexity is here that these scalars now can be real up to and not uh, between 0 and 1 anymore. So what does that mean? If you have x here and y there, and do you remember still that this is again y plus lambda uh, x minus y, still this vector pointing to there, and you're now allowed to add um, to scale this vector as you like. So not only um, scale it between 0 and 1, but scale it as you like. So what you get is the full connecting line. So this is the set of all points which you can form like this with an arbitrary lambda. And what is now important is no matter where the origin is, right? It's, so the origin could be here or there or anywhere, it doesn't matter. <coughs> okay, um, so one thing which are clear is the linear spaces. Uh, subspaces are affine. That's clear. That's just yeah. 
um, because this is a linear combination then, um, but also um, if, um, if S is affine, then it's always of the form, um, then S is of the form A plus L for um, subspace L. So the affine spaces are just translations of the subspaces. That's it, no, nothing else. So this affine is kind of a very simple notion. It's just the translated subspaces. Okay, um, and what is also clear of the, by just by formula also is that an affine space is always convex because you have even more freedom to do combinations. So the next notion is um, affine combination. We have convex combination, um, which was this thing here where these lambdas need to be non-negative and sum up to one and affine combination is different. We drop the non-negativity. Um, so say um, X is an affine combination of X1 to Xn if X is equal to some lambda I Xi with some scalars um, lambda such that um, lambda i sum up to one. That's an affine combination also by analogy more or less. Okay. <clears throat> Good. We'll come to that in, uh, later on a little bit more. Um, to keep track of time so I have, I have planned a small a short break um, but probably we'll do um, two more definitions in the beginning of convex analysis you all really, really have a lot of definitions a um, lot of notions um, so but luckily at least the first so convexity convex sets convex combination and uh, affine set affine combination they are very basic it's really just um, they're very simple to memorize so then of course um, you could also define the, the affine hull and this is done so um, for some set s and rd the affine hull uh, it's called f of s um, is um, the set of all affine combinations of elements of x all affine combinations of elements in S. Um, and again, alternate, alternatively, we could say that um, the affine hull is the smallest affine set which contains S. Okay. Um, so, so the smallest affine set this contains. So if you, yeah. if you have two points here, then that would be the affine hull already. And if you have three points, it would be the full sheet of paper. So the full, the full R2. Okay, um, and it looks like it's related to the span, uh, to the linear span, or the, uh, something also called, also called linear hull. But the linear hull also kind of involves the origin, and this is uh, independent of where the origin lies. So what is now important is that the affine hull is, um, is a subset of Rd, so inherits uh, a subspace topology. But on the other hand, it's also, yeah, it, it inherits a subspace topology. So you can also measure distances like you do um, uh, in RD, just the same thing. And you also have the same notions of open and closed, just inherited by subspace topology. Um, so what you can do um, if you have um, a subset of an affine space, you can talk about the interior and the closure within this set. And that's important. Um, and that's the last thing we're going to do before the uh, before the break. So maybe I just do a short sketch. So if you have a one-dimensional affine space here, and you have a subset, maybe like this. This is a subset of this affine space. So this is, um, let's say, S, and the subset here is C, and everything happens within R two, and the S is, looks like an like a, like like the real line, but at some other point. Ah, oh, there's more votes in the um, I see. Okay. And the picture does not change more or less. It's still um, three against three. Okay. No, okay, but, but that's still fine. So, um, what is the interior of the set C? And this now depends on how you view it. If you view C as a subset of R two, 
Yeah, then there is no interior. The interior is empty because no point here uh, has any um, any neighborhood which lies completely in C. No point does. All the neighborhoods around any point in C just stick out. But if you consider C as a subset of S <coughs> and use the topology uh, within the set S, the interior would just be this, the same set without but without the two endpoints. So and this is not empty. It's, uh, it's still, most of the set is still here. So, um, and this notion is important, um, and that is the, the so-called relative interior. So the definition 1.7, and this is something which is usually not done anything in anywhere else, um, is um, the, the relative interior. So if you have S subset of RD, <coughs> then the relative interior often denoted by R i of s, sometimes also denoted by rel int of s, <coughs> um, is uh, the interior with respect to the um, affine hull of s. Um, is, is the interior of s with respect to wrt um, the affine hull of S. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, so, and in formula, you could also write it down like this. And for some reason, I have C and not S in there. But anyway, if I do with an S here, the relative interior of S is then equals the set of all X such that um, there exists an epsilon, a non negative one, such that the ball of radius epsilon. Around x, so and if I would now write a subset of C, this would be the normal interior of S, of course, would be the normal interior. But what we don't know do is we do subspace topology, which means that we intersect with the f fine hull of C, and uh, lead that this is subset of C. So that is just here. This is this is the notion of the um, uh, interior respect to another. Uh, yeah, fine. Hard. Oh, and I did C and not S. Come on. So why is that so difficult? S, of course, S and S. <coughs> okay, that is the relative interior, an important notion, and this is here. The, the, it's, a, it's a crucial difference. So we kind of take the smallest linear space, linear affine set, uh, which contains the set, uh, the set you're dealing with. Um, so probably I should, if, if, I, uh, if I change everything here, I probably ought to change it here. Um, so, that, so that the picture corresponds to what is here. So this would not be C, this would be S, and this purple line would be the affine hull of S. Okay, and of course um, we could do other things. We could say, <coughs> um, if we take the, the, the closure and subtract the relative interior, this is called the relative boundary of C. <coughs> so note that there is no relative with respect to something because it's uh, the with respect to part also comes from the set S and the respect to is with respect to the F and hell of S itself. Um, okay, um, you may ask yourself why is there no relative closure? There's a relative interior, a relative boundary. Why is there no relative closure? And the reason is that the closure is always part uh, subset of the affine hull. It does not change. So the, the relative closure uh, would be this is the same thing than the than the closure itself. So this gives nothing new. So of course, you see, um, so the boundary of this set S here <coughs> uh, and the um, would be um, the full set S plus these two limiting points are the endpoints here, but the relative point boundary would just be these two endpoints here. <coughs> so also this is uh, different. Okay, so now um, we basically covered half of the lecture and it's time for a break. <coughs> so it will be two minutes break and um, so to have you, uh, you may just go over what we've done already, but you may also relax and so that the, that the break is not too boring. I just uh, some um, loyalty free music and um, yeah some 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 dad jokes <laughs> so have fun see you see you here in two minutes <laughs>
So, okay, I'm back. Okay, um, so let's continue. So in case you have any other, any other things, um, which, uh, any proposals, what you could do in, uh, with the breaks, um, I'm open for suggestions, but as, as long as there are dead jokes available and no other um, suggestions come in, I'll just keep posting more dead, joke, dead jokes. <coughs> okay, so where were we? Um, the relative interior. Um, yeah, and the relative interior has <coughs> some interesting properties and will also be the um, topic of the lecture tomorrow morning, yeah, the exercise class tomorrow morning. Um, uh, so there's another um, proposition I write down here and we don't prove it here. Some of these are obvious, some are not so obvious and I think uh, some of the parts that are not so obvious will also be dealt with in the exercise. So what the proposition goes as follows. Proposition 1.8 <coughs> um, has also five points. Um, so if um, if C is convex um, No, uh, and um, C is not empty, then it holds um, that the relative interior is also convex <coughs> um, and this also holds a C is uh, empty, but anyway, um, that the affine hull of the relative interior is uh, the same as the affine hull of the closure. So which means that, so if you form the affine hull, it really not depends if you if you close the set first or take the relative interior, it stays the same. <coughs> so from the point of view of the affine hull, um, yeah, kind of remove going to the interior respect to the hull or closing, everything doesn't matter. So these have the same, the same thing in the end. Okay. Um, <coughs> so that's one thing. Um, so now if you have C convex and uh, another matrix, but now you need invertible, and so for invertible you need square. So if you have a D times D invertible matrix, um, and another vector B in RD, um, then it holds that A times the relative interior of C um, plus B is the same of the relative interior of A times C plus B. So kind of this uh, affine linear shift um, is kind of yeah inter commutes uh, with building uh, forming the relative interior. Um, so if you have um, if A is just any matrix uh, in R M times D, then you still have that A times the relative interior of C um, equals the relative interior of A C. But for shift it doesn't work. <coughs> Okay, now point three is um, uh, there's now a characterization of for some point to be in the in the relative interior. This is kind of important. Uh, Max has a name for it. I forgot it. Um, I forgot the name of this property. Um, so if you have C convex, um, then X is in the relative interior of C um, if and only if. Um, if and only if for all y which are in the affine hull of C, um, there exists an epsilon and a negative one um, such that the points uh, x plus and minus epsilon times y minus x um, is still in C. <coughs> so to be in the in the relative interior, um, you need to be able to walk a little bit into the direction of every point in the affine hull and still need to stay inside C. That's relative interior. Um, yeah. So this is the affine hull here. Um, so the point in the relative interior, if and only if, um, starting from X, you can go a little way into the direction of any point Y which is in the affine hull and still stay in the set C. So that's the characterization of the relative interior. Okay, um, good. And it basically looks like the definition, but it's maybe it's a little bit more convenient. Okay, um, so um, if we have C1 and C2 convex sets, um, then it holds um, that uh, the closure of these two convex sets 
um, is equal if and only if um, the relative interior is equal. Ah, prolongation property, yeah, thanks. Um, this guy here, uh, I think it should be three, right? This this here, um, um, prolongation property, so you can prolong them. Why not? Good name. Um, so the closure of convex sets is equal if and only if their relative in series are equal. Okay. Let's prove that it his prolongation um, property. <coughs> okay. So this seems that this uh, is wrong without convexity and also wrong without interior here. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, of course it's wrong without interior. Okay, um, last point of the proposition is um, for two sets C1 and C2, which are CVX, it holds that the relative interior of the sum, so the Minkowski sum, is equal to the Minkowski sum of the relative interior. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, so and what I wanted to note here is, so the proof is not always, not every point is trivial here, but it's all doable. Um, and um, the second point here is actually very helpful to prove, um, to prove the others. So and why is that? Um, so what always holds is, um, so maybe I just write it down here in, in some brackets here. Um, what is important is that the affine hull of some set C is always an, an m-dimensional affine space. And that means that is um, an m-dimensional subspace plus a vector. So a tra translation of an m-dimensional subspace. An m-dimensional subspace means just it's spanned by m not, um, linearly independent vectors. So, what, what, but now you can move that space around by applying an invertible matrix and shifting it. So you can always uh, do the following. You can always, without loss of generality, you can always assume that the affine hull is of the form um, so without loss of generality, WLOG, uh, without loss of generality, we can assume that the affine um, set, the affine um, hull of C is equal to a subspace V, which is of the form, this is all the vectors X, such that the last coordinates are all zero. So you basically, if you have an uh, if you have an affine sub uh, subspace somewhere, you can always shift it around to lay it flat down that the um, the last coordinates are all zero. So then it's just it's then this is um, it's just a copy of R n sitting nicely in R d. Um, yeah, and that's just it. Oh, and I for some reason I had R n here and not d, but anyway. So um, you can always assume that the f and that c is full dimensional within its affine hull. So and this is then helpful to prove the rest. So you can def you know, you reduce everything to the, to the full dimensional case and then only think in that. Okay. Um, so but um, so you can always assume that the affine hull is a full space. But then you, it's not that. Uh, so it sounds like the affine hull. If you can assume that the affine hull is a full space, so why do it in the first place? Isn't then the interior basically the same thing as the interior? No, it's not. Um, so it behaves like the interior, but only as, as long as you only consider one set. If you consider two sets, they have their own affine hulls that may be different. And um, so the relative interior is taken with respect to different um, surrounding spaces. And one thing which is not true, um, I don't write it like this. I write them. So what? What is so? Maybe I just write the sign here for um, dangerous bend. Be careful to not yeah leave the road. Um, if you have C one as a subset of C two, it's not necessarily true um, that the relative interior of C one is also contained in the relative interior of C two. So that's not a valid implication. And. Um, the example is pretty simple. We take um, as the larger set, we take a square like that. And so this is C2. And as the smaller set, we take a side. So 
So what is um, the relative interior? So the relative interior of C2 is the square without the boundary. So everything which is inside the square. But the relative interior of C1 is the side without the, uh, without the corners. So actually the relative interior of C1 is totally outside of the relative interior of C2. Okay, because well, the, the relative interior of C1 is taken with respect to a much smaller surrounding space, so it much more remains inside the set. So this is not true. Even though you can, if you work with the affine, uh, with the relative interior of a set, you can always assume kind of the set is the affine hull is full dimensional, but everything happens within this individual affine hull. Okay, mm, that was that. Okay, good. And um, so, yeah, now I said that um, the affine um, hull and affine combinations kind of have something to do with the linear combinations. And um, yeah, this is so. And actually there's even a notion of um, um, independence, not in a linear way, but in an affine way. That's the next definition. Definition 1.9 says, um, if you have n plus one points, in uh, Rd, Rd, they should um, give names x0 to xn, subset uh, or subset contained in Rd or elements of Rd um, are affinely independent. Affinely independent um, if their affine hull has the largest, uh, has the dimension n. If the affine hull of these points x0 to xn um, is um, an n-dimensional affine set, an n-dimensional affine space. So it is of the form some vector plus an n-dimensional vector space. Um, so when this is, you need n plus one points, uh, and then there's still an n-dimensional affine space. So you see this um, in the simple example of two points. If you have x0 here and x1 over there, these are two points, n is one. Um, the affine hull is that line connecting these two points, and that's a one-dimensional affine space. Um, there's a translation of a, of a one-dimensional subspace, so these two points are affinely independent. And if the two points sit on the same point, um, then they are not. Okay, that's affinely independent, <coughs> the affine independence. <coughs> and what ha does this have to do with linearly independence? Um, yeah, so what is now important is that the affine hull um, of the set of points um, it contains all the points x1, uh, x0 to xn. And this is of the, it is of the form some point within the set plus the linear space. So actually we could, we could distinguish the point x0 if we like, because this is contained in the set, plus a vector space, um, plus v. Um, and this v, um, this is spanned by, um, sorry, I think this is, this is a notion I'm going to use for span. I don't, I don't like that notion, actually it looks too much like um, in the products, let's, let's write span for the linear hull. This, um, this is the span of the vectors x1 minus x0, x2 minus x0, and so on, until xn minus x0. So that's the possibility to describe the affine hull of uh, n plus one points. You distinguish the first one, take it as an anchor, and then you, if you have here x1, uh, x0, let's say, and here we have x1, and here we have x2, say, um, you take this as an anchor, um, and then you take these connecting vectors here, going from um, x0 to x1 and from x0 to x2, and take the linear space, which is spanned by these two vectors, and kind of anchor it to um, the point x0 then this is what you get uh, as the affine hull. So, um, and what you can just deduce from this, <coughs> um, you want to have, so what was the notion of affinely independent? These points are affinely independent. If this is an n-dimensional affine space, this is the case if V is an n-dimensional vector space, 
And this is the case if these n vectors here are linearly independent. So we, we can deduce <coughs> um, that the points x0 to xn are uh, finally independent if and only if the vectors x1 minus x0 to xn minus x0 are linearly independent. <coughs> well, that's a pretty simple notion, finally. Okay, <coughs> so we can use this um, to um, write down the next proposition. So yeah, this is uh, yeah. And this basically illustrates it, right? You have these three points, and the affine spaces, uh, the affine hull is just the the, 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 the um, plane which goes through these three points. Um, you can anchor it at these, at x zero, and only consider the direction from x zero into the uh, in, into the direct from x zero to x one, from x zero to x two, um, and then you see that these two vectors here need to be linearly independent, so that this v is two dimensional so that this affine space is two-dimensional and so that these, X, um, these three vectors are affinely independent. Okay, we use this to form the following proposition. Um, so in an affine space, you could still use, you could somehow use the points x0 to xn as coordinates. So you remember that if you have a space, a linear space spanned by an, uh, a number of vectors, which and then these are linearly independent, you can write every element in this space here as a unique linear combination of these things. And what we want to do here in this proposition is to write something similar down um, in the case of the affine hull, that we can re represent the vectors in the affine hull uniquely in a special way. So uh, let's say we have x0 to xn, um, are finally independent, um, then <coughs> it holds. Um, then it holds that each x in uh, the affine hull of this set um, has a unique representation um, as affine combination x equals lambda i x i i now goes from 0 to n so that's yeah that's just it so if you have uh, affinely independent points um, then each point in the affine hull of this set can be uniquely uh, represented as an affine combination of these points and these lambdas here are the so-called baricentric um, or the nates of the affine hull. Um, okay, so the illustration of this, um, you probably know that. Um, um, so if we have points which form a triangle, three points, so these are the points x0, x1, x2, then, oops, I'm going off screen here. <coughs> Um, then if you have any point, uh, any point in the plane actually, but for illustration I take a point inside the triangle, you can write this as an affine combination, as a unique affine combination of these three points. And these are the biocentric coordinates. So the biocentric coordinates of this point here would be the vector of one, zero. let's take it as a, as a list. So these are the coordinates uh, one, zero, zero. These are the coordinates uh, zero, one, zero. This is uh, zero, zero, one, and this is something else here. It's, a, it's kind of a little bit more of x one, not so much of x two, and not so much of x one, of x zero. And the point right in the middle here, um, the very center of the set, would be um, one half, one half, one half. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, I guess that's correct. <laughs> yeah. So the, the line in the middle here would be one half, one half, zero. The very center coordinates, and then you go half in this direction, and then you end up in the very center of this triangle of course and if you take negative uh, coefficients you can you will be outside of this uh, triangle okay <coughs> um let's prove that and i think we basically proved it already but um just write it down as a proof here for convenience um yeah we write down m so we, we, we call m the affine hull of these sets yeah, of these points and write it as x0 plus v, as we did it here. And this v should be the span 
of x1 minus x0 until xn minus x0. <coughs> so these points are affine independent, these points are linearly independent, and um, so, um, so we, if we have a vector of y which is in v, um, we have a unique representation um, as y being a linear combination of lambda i of these vectors here, meaning x y, x i minus x zero, and i goes from one to n. <coughs> so. Uh, okay, now every m uh, is of uh, has a unique decomposition as x zero plus an element in v. Um, so if we have an x in m, this x is of the form x zero plus y, with y in m, and this is uniquely determined. There's only one m which has this property, uh, one y which has this property here, um, and so for this y by the above can be written as x0 um, plus the sum i from 1 to n lambda i x i minus x0. Um, mm -hmm. And now what remains is to show that this is actually an affine combination of the x1, um, x0 to x1. <coughs> and maybe I did something wrong here, let me check. So how do we write this as an affine combination? Um, uh, of course, of course, um, this can be now written as, um, sum i of 1 to n, lambda i x i. Um, then this is just this here, and we have plus x0 and minus uh, the sum over lambda i and then x0, like that. Maybe this is a bit too complicated, so what we can do, what I wanted to do was write it as um, sum of x goes from 1 to n, lambda i x i plus 1 minus the sum of the lambda i, i goes from 1 to n x0. And so now what we do is we define this here, oh, I'm off screen, no, no. Um, as lambda 0, and um, then that is the sum of the lambda i, x i, i now starting from 0 to n, and um, so by definition, um, the lambda i's sum to 1. Um, yeah. Uh, with plus by definition the lambda i if i starts from 0 to n they sum to 1 uh, because of the definition of lambda 0. That's just it and that was um, the last uh, proposition you wanted to deal here. Okay. <coughs> okay um, and then the final thing is um, I wanted to introduce a special um, convex set which will probably be used in the following. Um, so no space anymore. I just write it because it's the last thing we're going to do today. I just write it here in the corner, just to save a, save a little more trees by using a little less paper. Um, no, that's something else. <coughs> um, so if you take, for example, the convex hull of the standard unit vectors, um, so. Um, Ah, no, 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 um, so, yeah. so first, um, if we have affinely independent points x0 uh, to xn, um, affinely independent, then um, the convex hull of these points, so conf of x0 to xn, this is called a simplex. Um, it's, uh, and usually it's called, I think it's called, um, I forgot if it's n or n plus one limit. Let's just call it simplex. Um, so if you have three points and if you have three affinely independent points, then the convex hull would be a triangle. So no matter what the surrounding space dimension is, uh, so it's a I think it's called a two-dimensional um, 
simplex. If you have three points, they, uh, the convex hull is a tetraeder if the, con if the points are finely independent. So if not, um, the convex hull of four points may also be a triangle. But if they are finely independent, it would be a tetraeder. Uh, tetrahedron, I think it's the English word. Um, yeah, and this is, these th shapes are called uh, simplices. Um, special um, of special importance is uh, the so-called probability simplex, which uh, is kind of the set of all probability measures on endpoints, um, and also called the standard simplex. And this is usually denoted by delta d, which is just the convex set of um, the standard basis vectors. Um, this is called the standard simplex. Um, or probability simplex. So standard simplex because it uses the standard basis vectors and probability simplex because um, the elements here are just um, vectors of length d with non-negative entries that sum to 1. So it's, prob it's a probability measure on, on, on d points. And um, illustration looks like this if we have the um, three space dimensions here, 1, 2, and 3. We have the unit vectors, um, maybe here, here, and here. And so the convex hull is this, uh, the bonus bone is the convex hull in this, this here. <coughs> that's uh, the standard simplex. And that's um, uh, an important point, um, important case of, <coughs> um, of convex sets. Because sometimes uh, it, it's, kind of, for example, if, if it's an important constraint um, which may appear in, in a convex optimization problem, so you might want to look for a vector which is sums to one and is non negative and also has some other constraints <coughs> or has to fulfill some optimality condition or something. Okay, <coughs> that was the first lecture. Um, a lot of notions. Maybe we could have a small recap because we still have 15 minutes, minutes left. Um, so what, what did we do today? First thing we did was um, introducing the notion of convex sets, which is very basic and probably have been treated in the first or second um, semester already. Um, set is convex is if all connecting lines between two points in the set is again in the set. <coughs> um, then this gives the notion of convex hull and convexity is preserved under a lot of uh, operations, the Minkowski sum, scaling, linear maps, uh, products, um, intersection, so of course not union. If you have the union of two convex sets, it's not convex anymore. You can destroy it very easily. But also closure and interior stay convex. Um, we have the notion of affine set, which comes from the notion of affine combination, which is just um, dropping the sign condition um, that the, the coefficients coefficients should, should be non-negative. If you drop that, you get affine space, so you kind of extend convex sets beyond in the other dimensions, in the other directions. Um, we have affine combinations, and we also have an affine hull, which is the smallest affine set which contains um, the set we, we're talking about. And the main importance of this affine hull is um, to introduce the relative interior, which is the interior with respect to the own affine hull. Okay. Um, and this notion has a few pitfalls. First, it behaves relatively nice. Um, for example, the affine hull of the interior, the relative interior and the enclosure stays the same, which really means that the affine hull is the important set where everything happens. Um, you can translate, um, or, yeah, translate and deform by an invertible matrix and uh, kind of preserve relative interiors. Um, you can also just forward map by linear maps to preserve relative interiors. Um, and you have this uh, prolongation property. If you have a uh, if you have a convex set, and want to know if you're in, so if you're in the relative interior, you can move in all directions, which are given by the affine hull, a um, little bit, and stay in the set. And if you can do so, then you have the point in the relative interior. Um, so this is a false point. Is another instance saying that the, the relative interior is kind of the, the right notion for convexity because the closure is the same if the relative interior is the same if and only if um, and the relative interior also um, kind of distributes by Minkowski addition. Um, and then you had this notion of affinely independent. So if you have several points or n plus one points in, in some d dimensional space, um, they are affinely independent if the affine set, uh, affine hull is um, has dimension n. 
and by dimension it's always meant the dimension um, of the vector space which is kind of translated to form the f fine hull. So f fine hulls are always of this form anchor plus um, some dimensional some some vector space and this vector space can even all, always written like this and this is full dimensional if and only is these are linearly independent and so we get this. Um, yeah and f fine independent um, uh, points give a notion of uh, barycentric coordinates within the f fine hull. So for example you can use barycentric coordinates in the probability simplex if you like to describe the points in the probability simplex but then these are exactly the same as the entries. So the entries of the vector in this case are exactly the barycentric coordinates and so by deformation um, you have also a kind of an intuition where so what are the barycentric coordinates with respect to these um, three arbitrary points. <coughs> okay that was it for today. Um, tomorrow at 8 there will be um, the exercise class so you can get to know Max in case you don't know him already um, and uh, may have questions or you may have questions about the first exercise sheet um, and then tomorrow at I think it's 11.30 we're going to meet again here um, for the next lecture. So that's it for today um, and bye.